six foot five, 215 pounds, crazy athletic and impeccable work ethic. This seems like the prototype for a Hall of Fame level shooting guard, but Kendall Gill would finish his 15 year career without even getting an all-star selection. His time spent in the league involved him flying under the radar and quickly being dismissed as the focal point of an offense when players more typical of that era came along. And when he spoke about his frustrations, he received the reputation of being a difficult player. It is worth mentioning that he came into an era that was still dominated by the big man. And even though he was receiving the unattainable label of the next Michael Jordan when he entered the league, Kendall Gill never reached that level. But the discrepancy between these expectations and his career accomplishments invalidate how good of a player he was when he was healthy and in a good situation. So today, we're going to jog your memory and revisit the career of Kendall Gill. Kendall Gill attended Rich Central High School in Olympia Fields, Illinois. As a senior, Gill and the Olympians finished as runner-up for the Boys AA IHSA Tournament. Gill led the team in scoring throughout the four games of the tournament, averaging 13.5 points per game. Gill attended in-state University of Illinois to play for the Fighting Illini. Gill did not start his freshman year, and as he explains it, he was not a very sought-after recruit compared to other teammates and freshmen. Gill would play in 31 games, but wouldn't start any of them, playing about 11 minutes per game, as the Illini went 23-8 and and were upset by Austin P in the first round of the tournament. For his freshman season, Gill would average about 3.5 points, 1.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game, and an impressive 1.3 steals. The 1988 season saw Gill receive a major role increase, as he played in 33 games, starting 23 of them, and was second on the team in minutes per game. The Illini also received a boost in the form of Nick Anderson and Kenny Battle, who both sat out the previous season, but were the team's top two scorers this season. The Illini had similar team success, as they finished 23-10, and 10, and this time made it to the second round, where they would lose to Villanova. Gill would put up averages of about 10.5 points, 2 rebounds, and 4 assists as well as two steals per game. 1989 produced one of the greatest seasons in program history, as Gill teamed with Anderson, Battle, Marcus Liberty, Steve Bardot, and Lowell Hamilton to form the electric flying Illini. And Gill had improved for the third straight year, as he was now third on the team in scoring and averaged five more points than the previous season. The Illini played exciting above the rim basketball to finish the season 31 and five and enter the tournament as a one seed. They would make a deep tournament run that would see them face eventual national champion Michigan in the Final Four. But after a hard-fought game, Michigan's Sean Higgins would hit a putback layup with one second left to give Michigan the win. Although it was a disappointing finish to the season, Gill still had a great season, as he averaged about 15.5 points, 3 rebounds, 4 assists, and 2.5 and steals per game. Initially, Illinois had high hopes for the following season. Even though they had lost battle due to graduation, Anderson had told the team that he would be back for his senior season. But on the very last day to declare for the draft, Anderson did just that, which dealt a major blow to the Illini offense. Gill and Liberty became the team's two main stars, and Gill once again improved as he led the team in scoring as well as the Big Ten. He was also voted a consensus second team All-American and first team All-Big Ten for his efforts. The Illini took a step back as they finished just 21-8 before losing to Dayton in the first round. Gill had showed his all-around ability this season, as he averaged 20 points, which was the highest average for an Illinois player since Rick Schmidt in 1975, as well as 5 rebounds and 3.5 and assists, and for his third straight season averaging at least 2 steals per game. Gill improved each year of his college career, and showed exceptional ability on both sides of the ball. The player that wasn't even interviewed by his hometown newspaper when he was a freshman was now a projected lottery pick going into the NBA draft. The upstart Charlotte Hornets, set to begin their third season of existence, chose Gill with the fifth pick in the 1990 NBA draft. Similar to his time in Illinois, Gill had to pay his dues and earn his time on the court during his rookie season, as Charlotte already had a veteran backcourt consisting of Muggsy Bogues and Rex Chapman. But Gill played in all 82 games and even started 36 of them. But Gill's addition wasn't nearly enough to make the Hornets competitive, as they finished 26 and 56 and missed the playoffs. However, Gill would put up a respectable 11 points, 3 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game, which earned him a spot on the All-Rookie First Team. Gill also found himself participating in the 1991 dunk contest at All-Star Weekend along with teammate Rex Chapman, but he would unfortunately finish last. The Hornets had added a crucial piece in their early success during the 1991 NBA Draft in Larry Johnson out of UNLV, and the loss of Rex Chapman to Washington meant Gill would be the team's starting shooting guard. And Gill delivered as he would up his scoring average by nearly 10 points and lead the team in scoring, while Johnson would win Rookie of the Year. 
The Hornets improved slightly at 31 and 51, but would still miss the playoffs. And for the regular season, Gil would average 20 and a half points, five rebounds, four assists, and nearly two steals per game. The 1993 season started with another huge piece to the Hornets puzzle, as they had brought in rookie Alonzo Mourning to pair with Larry Johnson to create the best young front court in the league. And it paid off as both Johnson and Mourning averaged at least 21 points per game, and the team went 44 and 38 and made the playoffs, where they would beat the Celtics in four games to win the franchise's first ever playoff series. But they would go on to lose to the Knicks in the second round. Gill would play well in the Celtics series, averaging 19 and a half points and two steals per game. But he struggled more in the Knicks series as his averages dropped nearly four points, but he was still effective on the defensive end as he averaged 2.6 steals per game. However, this season was marred by a contract dispute between Gill and the Hornets, as well as Gill reportedly becoming unhappy in Charlotte with the arrivals of Johnson and Mourning, resulting in feuds with teammates. And these issues were the beginnings of Gill developing a reputation of being difficult that would plague him for the next few years. And for the regular season, Gill would average about 17 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. On August 27, 1993, Gill would get the contract he desired, but the Hornets did not have intention of keeping him and instead signed him so that they could shop him, but still be able to keep the team intact if they didn't like their options. But the Hornets found an option that they liked, and traded Gil to the Seattle Supersonics on September 1st for picks and a couple role players. On paper, Gil seemed like the missing piece to a team that was one win away from the Western Conference Finals the previous season, and boasted budding stars in Gary Payton and Sean Kemp, as well as adding Detlef Schrempf to the team. The Sonics would have a great regular season, finishing at 63-19, and, and would enter the playoffs as the one seed in the West, where they would play the 8 seed Denver Nuggets. But after jumping out to a 2-0 series lead, the Sonics would drop the final three games and lose the series, marking the first time an 8 seed beat a 1 seed. Gill played a good series, but just wasn't a focal point in the offense, as he averaged just under 13.5 points and was fourth on the team in scoring for the series. And for the regular season, Gill would average about 14 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. The 1995 season would be much of the same for Gill and the Sonics, as the team finished near the top of the NBA with a 57 and 25 record and played the Lakers in the first round, where they would lose in four games. Gill would see himself in a much lesser role during the playoffs as he lost his starting spot to Nate McMillan and came off the bench, averaging under six and a half points in 18 minutes per game. And for the regular season, Gill saw his scoring average dip for the third season in a row, as he would average about 13 and a half points, four rebounds, and two and a half assists per game. This would be a tumultuous regular season for Gill, as he missed time with a bruised kidney and also took time off after becoming depressed, which he would later say was exhaustion. In April 1995, after going four nights without sleeping, George Carl was a big reason for Gill's mental and performance struggles during Gill's time in Seattle, as Gill reported that Carl deemed Gill unworthy of his contract and that Gill had demanded guaranteed playing time as part of the deal. Carl also apparently would take Gill out of the starting lineup right before games and call him a pretty boy in front of the team. And it even got to the point that Gill didn't want to play anymore and was hoping for injury so that he would sit out. So in late June, Gill was traded back to the Hornets for Hersey Hawkins. An interesting story is that on January 26, 1995, the New York Daily News reported that there was a deal in place which would have sent Gill to the Blazers in return for their franchise superstar Clyde Drexler straight up. But the trade didn't happen as according to Blazers GM Bob Whitsitt, no matter how hard he tried to sell the deal to Sonics GM Wally Walker, Walker still pulled out as he didn't feel comfortable doing business with Whitsitt. As Whitsitt would reportedly say to Walker, I'm trading the most popular player in the history of the franchise to the arch enemy who is probably going to win the championship and I'll probably be run out of town after year one. So you have no risk. You're still going to be great. Then finally, Wally just said, I'm not comfortable making a deal with you, so I'll pass. Gill started the 1996 season in familiar territory, back where it all began. Gill would be back with former running mate Larry Johnson, but this time, instead of Alonzo Mourning, the team's other star would be Glenn Rice, who was acquired in a trade for Mourning days before the start of the season. Gill was a starter for the team, but Johnson and Rice got the majority of the shots, as Gill's scoring average with Charlotte dipped yet again, as he was reportedly unhappy with his role on the team. Fortunately for Gill, he was the main piece in a trade to the Nets that saw the Hornets receive Nets point guard Kenny Anderson. Gill only played in 11 games for the Nets this season as he fractured his hand in a February 14th win versus Indiana. But during those 11 games, he had his highest scoring average since the 1992 season. The Nets would finish with a 30-52 record and miss the playoffs. 
And overall, for the 47 games that Gil played this season, he averaged 14 points, 5 rebounds, and a career-high 5.5 assists per game. The Nets would start the season with a healthy Gil, rookie Kerry Kittles, and rebounding machine Jason Williams. But on February 13th, the Nets would add more firepower mid-season, after a 14-34 start, when they traded for Sam Cassell and Jim Jackson from the Mavericks. But it would be too little too late, as the Nets finished 26-56 and, and missed the playoffs. Gill would average a career-high 21.8 points to lead the team in scoring, while adding about 6 rebounds, 4 assists, and nearly 2 steals per game. Gill would also score a career-high 41 points on January 13th versus the Magic, and surprisingly, Gill did all of this playing out of position, as he was playing at small forward. But more important was that Gill was shedding the reputation that had been placed on him somewhat unfairly so early in his career, as he was reportedly mentoring the young players on the team, specifically taking rookie Kerry Kittles under his wing, while also earning the respect and liking of the veterans. And he would also receive the ultimate compliments from his coach, as he was deemed easy to coach, would do whatever was asked of him, and was one of the hardest workers on the team. The 1998 season saw a full year of Cassell and Gill. Williams was still with the team, second year guard Kerry Kittles improved, and the team added second overall pick Keith Van Horn. But this meant the Nets had a lot of guys who needed the ball to be effective, and even though Gill started 81 games, he was fourth on the team in scoring. The Nets would, however, finish 43-39 and, and make the playoffs, the first time Gill had been to the playoffs since 1995. The Nets would get swept by the Bulls in a series that saw Cassell struggle with a strained groin that only allowed him to play 27 minutes across the three games. Even with the additional need for scoring, Gill didn't score much better than he did in the regular season, averaging just over 14 points for this series. Gill's lack of a long-range shot was evident in this series as he didn't attempt a single three-pointer. And for the regular season, Gill averaged about 13.5 points, 5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. The lockout-shortened 1999 season saw Gill play in all 50 games in a season which would begin with Cassell running the offense, but would end with Stefan Marbury as the team's point guard, as he came over in a three-team trade with Milwaukee and Minnesota on March 11. Gill would not have a lot of offensive success, as he shot below 40% from the field and had his lowest three-point percentage of his career but he would have one of the most prominent defensive seasons, as he would lead the league in steals, averaging 2.7 per game, including a points, rebounds, assists, steals, quadruple double, in which he had a career high and record tying 11 steals on April 3rd versus the Miami Heat. The Nets would have a poor season, as injuries affected the team and they finished 16-34 and, and missed the playoffs. And on the regular season, Gill averaged just under 12 points, 5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. 2000 was Gill's last season averaging double digits, and he would improve his scoring average from the previous year. Gill was switched back to shooting guard to start the season, which he was happy about, but he would eventually be switched back to small forward in early December after struggling to begin this season. And the switch proved to be a good one, as it helped him play much better for the remainder of the year. The Nets still couldn't translate that into overall success, as they missed the playoffs with a 31-51 and record. But Gill would finish third on the team in scoring, and overall he would put up averages of about 13 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. The 2001 season was a year of injuries for Gill, as he only played in 31 games. But when he did play, Gill was able to play shooting guard, due to a knee injury to Kittles that caused him to miss the entire season. The injuries and Stefan Marbury just not being the right player to lead the Nets, led to them finishing 26-56, and, and missed the playoffs. In Gill's shortened season, he averaged about 9 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. After four and a half years with the Nets, Gill signed with Miami as a free agent in 2002. Gill would play in 65 games, starting 49 of them, while also being reunited with his former teammate from a decade prior in Alonzo Mourning. The Heat were an aging team on the tail end of the best era of basketball in franchise history up to that point, and would finish the season with a 36-46 and record, and would not make the playoffs. Gill would have his lowest totals of his career up to that point as well, as he averaged about 5.5 points, three rebounds, and one and a half assists per game. He would also average less than one steal for the first and only time of his career. After a year in Miami, Gill signed with the Timberwolves to begin the 03 season, where he would play a bench role, but play in all 82 games for the first time since the 1997 season, and the third time in his career overall. Gill would play an important veteran and bench role for a 51 and 31 T-Wolves team that would make the playoffs. A season in which Gill shot a respectable 32% from three after five seasons of 29% or lower. The Timberwolves would run into the defending champion Lakers in the first round and lose in six. This would be the last postseason of Gill's career, and it wouldn't be anything too special for him, although he did shoot 50% from three over the course of the series, but he only shot four threes. For the regular season, Gill averaged about eight and a half points, three rebounds, and two assists per game. The 2004 season saw Gill on his fourth team in four years, 
as he signed with the Chicago Bulls in the offseason. Unfortunately, Gill would not be blessed with the same health he had the previous season as he missed 26 games due to injury, but would have his highest scoring average since 2000. However, the Bulls were in no position to compete and finished the season at 23-59 and, and missed the playoffs. For the season, Gill would average about 9.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. Another year, another team for Kendall Gill as 2005 saw him in a Milwaukee Bucks uniform, but he would only play from early December to early January for a total of 14 games for a 30-52 and 52 Bucks team. And for the season, Gill would average about 6 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game in what would be the final season of his career. Kendall Gill seems like a case of untapped potential, as he had all the physical tools and the work ethic to be one of the best, but it just never materialized. It's unfortunate that what should have been the best years of his career were spent in places that he didn't feel valued, and in the case of Seattle and George Carl, places that made him essentially hate the game that he had dedicated his life to. His time in New Jersey had so much potential and he showed his ability in the beginning, but the team quickly shifted their offensive focus to other players, leaving Gill as an afterthought. One thing that Gill always brought with him was a tenacious defense that served him so well for his entire career, which has him still sitting in the top 50 for all-time steals with 1,519, and his commitment to the upkeep of his body set an indirect example to everyone that he played with. As was evidenced by his early Nets teammates and coaches' statements, Gill was not the individual that the media made him out to be early in his career, and one can only wonder if he would have had more success had it not been for those claims on his character. And also what could have been different for him if he would have remained the focal point of an offense instead of franchises moving on from him as the number one option early in his tenure, as was the case with Charlotte and New Jersey. So this has been today's episode on the underrated two-way swingman Kendall Gill. I hope you enjoyed it and remember to subscribe for more videos like this one. Speaking of videos like this one, check out the video on the player he was traded back to Charlotte for, or this one on his Nets teammate. Thanks for watching and see you next time.